Hi, my name is Andrew Bagel. I'm a researcher in the Ability Research Group at MSR. And uh, today we have a nice uh, guest, Adam Barr, who uh, uh, used to work at Microsoft even as short as two years ago. Um, I met Adam a long time ago, actually, when he was in engineering excellence. And we were he gave me a lot of advice about how to work with uh, new employees at Microsoft, and especially how I used to do studies uh, to figure out how they adapted to life here, and Adam had lots of great advice about his observations of that process. Uh, before that, he was also uh, part of uh, Windows, and he's been working at Microsoft for in some uh, capacity over the last uh, 23 or so years. Um, so he's got lots to say, and today he's going to talk about a book he wrote called The Problem with Software, Why Smart Engineers Write Bad Code, and lessons that he has sort of picked up over the um, what he what we all perceive as sort of the last big uh, push in software engineering over the last 50 years and where we've come to and where we should be going in next as well. So thank you, Adam. Uh, please take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andy, for having me. Thank you for coming out. So as he said, I'm Adam Barr, and I wrote this book. Uh, this is my career, more or less. That I started out of college at a small company called Dendrite, which you probably haven't heard of. Then I came to Microsoft in early 1990. I worked on the first two versions of NT. I worked on an interactive television project, which went nowhere eventually, like most of Microsoft's interactive television projects. I worked on Digital Studio, a nonlinear video editor at a company in Montreal that we acquired. That's where I grew up. Worked on Windows 2000, also known as NT5. There's actually a break in there, right there. I actually wrote two books. One's called Proudly Serve My Corporate Masters, which is about the first 10 years, and then one is called Find the Bug about debugging and reading code, which you're welcome to peruse uh, after the talk. Then I came back, I was a PM on PowerShell. This was all dev. I was a PM on PowerShell. I worked in Engineering Excellence uh, for about five years. We gave out these nice Engineering Excellence awards. Um, no other logo, apparently I survived on the internet. Uh, then I went to office, worked on 2013, 2016, and the next version for a while, once Office started going <coughs> monthly shipping, the years stopped really uh, mattering as much. And now I work at a company called Crosslake, which is a consultancy that does due diligence for acquisitions. So if you're planning on buying a software company uh, and you want to kick the tires, just uh, let me know. I can help you out. So the term software engineering uh, was originated about 50 years ago. Actually, I wanted to subtitle the book something like The 50-Year Quest to Turn Software, to Turn Programmers into Software Engineers, but MIT Press said that was too long, so I just made it Why Smart Engineers Write Bad Code. But the term, uh, this, this city on the left here is, is Garmisch, Germany. So in 1968, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, decided that they were concerned about the quality of software <clears throat> used for military purposes, so they convened this software engineering conference, and it was the first time that the term software engineering really was used commonly. So they got a bunch of academics and a bunch of industry people together. They met, they agreed, yes, there's a problem with software. Uh, we need to work on it. We need to make real software engineers. Sounds great. Everyone went away happy. They came back a year later in Rome, and they had the second NATO software engineering conference, and they got into a big argument with the industry people saying the academics were, had their heads in the cloud, and the academics and the industry people just wanted to shove software out the door and didn't care about methods. And that was the end of the two-year uh, attempt to have a NATO software engineering conference. And that gap, the academic industry gap, has continued and grown in the last 50 years. That is the problem with software uh, that I mentioned in the book. But there's a lot of other good stuff, too. Um, so one example is language choice. So this is the, uh, the Tower of Babel. Uh, meant to symbolize the variety of human spoken languages. You probably recognize this image because in a hallway near your office is a half-completed jigsaw puzzle with this image on it. But it's symbolizing the variety of languages. If we look at computer languages, where they came from, so the first few languages came from academia. So basic was two guys at Dartmouth. Pascal was a guy in Switzerland at DTH. And ALGO was actually a committee of computer scientists who got together to create the language. Then he moved into this phase where research labs tended to invent languages, but that wasn't their main purpose. They had something else in mind, and they needed a better language. So Simula was a Norwegian lab, which was actually trying to do simulations, like traffic simulations. And they invented Simula, which was the first object-oriented language. 
Uh, C, C++ came out of Bell Labs. Again, they were trying to write better switching software. They weren't trying to create a language, but they needed a better language. And small talk, Xerox Park was doing research on graphical UIs and decided they needed a better language to write graphical UIs. So they came up with small talk. Again, it wasn't the goal to sell small talk. It was a means to an end. And now you have really companies creating languages. So the first two that really this happened was Objective-C and Eiffel, which were the two big object-oriented languages that were hyped. Eiffel. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying Eiffel's a great language, but they were the no, first. No, I put it up in academia. You put it up in academia? Well. Academia, it's a very interesting hybrid. It's, well, it's a hybrid, but the guy who wrote it, Bertrand Meyer. Yeah. And by the way, I, 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 I said hold questions, but you can interrupt. Like I said, I said something late. truly terrible. Uh, the key thing was he had a company, somewhere. Eiffel, that was selling Eiffel the language, and he was hyping object-oriented software because he wanted to sell Eiffel. And Brad Cox uh, came up with Objective-C and had a company selling Objective-C. That was the goal. So he was also hyping Objective-C, and he talked about how we're going to stitch together objects like integrated circuits on the motherboard. And, and Bertrand Meyer came in with Eiffel and said, oh, yeah, forget about it. Don't think about your actions. Think about your data. It'll change the world, you know, the, which is the fundamental object-oriented uh, hype. Um, and they were the first to really, like I said, that was the goal of the company. So they tended to overhype it because they were trying to sell software. And basically everything else is like that too, right? C Sharp, and Go, you know, uh, any Java. We're all companies doing this to sell the language or to sell a platform based on the language, right? So their motivations were a little suspect. And there's really no academic research about these languages. They're not backed by some explanation of why this language is better in this situation and that language is better. In some other situation, people are free to just make outrageous claims about the quality of their language and how it's awesome for everything um, because it's drifted away from academia. So what's, what's caused this drift? This is a diagram from Fred Brooks's book. Uh, it's in the book, The Mythical Man Month. It's not in the essay, The Mythical Man Month. So Fred Brooks's essay is famous, The Mythical Man Month, for saying if you add people to a software project that's late, you make it later. But this is something else he said that was very insightful, like most of his book. So in the top left, you have what he called the program, which is what you work on in school, what academics can handle, a professor and a couple of grad students. It's just a program, maybe three or four people work on it. It lasts for some short period of time, and it goes away. It fulfills its purpose. And Fred Brooks said, these things get complicated in two dimensions. One is you have a programming system where you have a software that's stitched together by multiple teams work, and they have APIs, and they have to integrate it, and not everybody can fit in the room. And it gets more complicated going down as well when you have a programming product, something that's sold, is maintained, it lives for years and years, the people working on it now are not the people who originally worked on it, and it's much more complicated. You have to worry about documentation and testing and maintaining it. And he said it gets three times more complicated in both dimensions, so a programming systems product, which is what company like Microsoft is working on, is nine times as complicated as a program. But actually, Edgar Dijkstra, uh, an academic and, and a perennial source of good quotes, actually claims it's 100 times uh, more complicated. So he said, it would be nice if I could illustrate the various techniques with small demonstration programs. This is in some uh, book he's writing about software. And could conclude with, and when faced with a program a thousand times as large, you can compose it in the same way. This would be self-defeating as one of my central themes. Will be that any two things that differ in some respect by a factor of already 100 or more are utterly incomparable. So he's saying this top left quadrant and the bottom right quadrant, although they're both software, are really very different. And then Harlan Mills, another, this is an IBM guy actually, a very well-known uh, guy who worked at IBM for a long time, leading software teams, has the same message. It's characteristic, the problems to be solved by advanced practitioners require sustained efforts over months or years. For many people, tens or hundreds, so this is the many years and the many people, right? It's both of the complications. This kind of mass problem solving requires a radically different kind of precision and scope than required for individual problem solvers. Now, this is 1980, right? This was understood by people at the end of the 1980s. Um, but instead of uh, kind of listening to this wisdom, people went searching for silver bullets. This is the Lone Ranger who's famous for shooting his enemies with silver bullets, just kind of a signature move. Uh, but silver bullets are, uh, if you want to kill a werewolf, and since we live in the Northwest, it might come in handy, uh, you need a silver bullet, apparently. Uh, and Fred Brooks wrote an essay called No Silver Bullet, in which he explained that we hear cries for a silver bullet, 
to make software costs drop as much as hardware costs. Uh, but we see no silver bullet on the horizon. There's no single development in technology or management, which gives even one order of magnitude improvement in productivity, reliability, and simplicity. And then the key point is, at the end, not only are there no silver bullets, now in view, the very nature of software makes it unlikely there will be any. And this is an important point. But despite that, the history of software engineering these last 50 years has been a search for silver bullets. People claiming that they have some technique that's going to make software simple and uh, make all the problems go away, or at least be minimized. So starting with structured programming, which is way back in the late 60s and early 70s, which is basically, although uh, it's interesting, every book about structured programming makes great claims about how it's awesome and then sort of confesses later that they're not really sure what structured programming really is, but it's got to be really important because everyone's talking about it. But basically, structured programming is not having go-tos in your code. Like, that's what it boils down to. Don't write assembly language in a higher level language. Uh, and that was a big thing. Oh, wow, everything's going to be saved by structured programming. Then we had formal testing was going to save the world. This is what our early 70s. People start talking about testing software. Then the entire collection of object-oriented programming, which led to design patterns, which led to unit tests, which led to TDD. That whole thing was individually and collectively going to save the planet. Agile, of course, is hyped to the sky. Now we've got functional programming. You've probably heard of DevOps. Well, again, it's going to solve all the problems. You can tell when you read a book about these stuff, and the prefix just makes these wild, the preface I mean, makes wild claims and doesn't really have much content that it's, you're in silver bullet territory. And it started way back in the day. This is a picture of a mainframe with tape reels to symbolize way back in the day. Um, the structured programming actually has an academic theory, a, a, a formal proof that you can write a program without go-tos. Uh, I won't read this quote because that's basically what it says. Um, now, the code that results if you formally apply this is actually really ugly and you would not want to write it. It's probably better to have go-tos than what this thing produces, but it actually at least was an academic saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to show that structured programming works. I'm not just going to claim it. Uh, and then formal testing, also you had both Dykstra, the academic, and Harlan Mills, the uh, practitioner, saying you can find bugs with formal testing, but you can't prove that your software doesn't have any bugs. Uh, note the dates. This is before Microsoft was founded. And yet, Microsoft embarked, starting in, I don't know, 1985 or something, on a 15-year mission to show that you could, in fact, prove software correct with formal testing, which didn't go all so well, but, but the problem was Microsoft ignored uh, the history here, unfortunately. And many other companies did too. I'm not picking on Microsoft, I just happen to know a lot about it. Um, but that was kind of it, where the, the, the really trying to figure these silver bullets out with any kind of research ended. There was some research, people used to study programmers in the 70s. Uh, people actually studied commenting style. I mean, you can read these papers, it's quite interesting. Uh, you know, commenting style, do variable names matter? There's actually a theory that it was better to have you know, like random variable names rather than ones that made sense because it forced you to pay more attention when reading the code. I mean, <laughs> maybe it's a crazy idea, but people actually studied it. You know, this is the main thing. They did a little A-B experiments. Uh, indenting, does indenting matter, believe it or not? Go-to, people tried to study, does, is code clearer with go-to or not? Are there certain cases where it's better to have go-tos? That kind of thing. Again, note the dates are all kind of in the 70s. Um, but Fred Brooks pointed out this kind of died out. So he wrote an update to Mythical Man Month in the mid-90s, and he said he was surprised how few of the things that he asserted were critiqued, proven, or disproven. He wasn't claiming everything was right. He was just surprised that nobody really studied it in any kind of empirical way by ongoing research and experience. Uh, and so you get comments like this, talking about Hungarian notation. Uh, this is in the book Showstopper, which documents the, the first product cycle of Windows NT. Coding style wars are a waste of valuable resources, although the confusion caused by Hungarian probably wastes more time. Um, so this is an unidentified Windows NT 3.1 developer in 1992. It's not me, even though I was an unidentified Windows NT developer in 1992. Um, but I did buy into this at the time, uh, a few years out of college, because NT didn't use Hungarian, so it must be be right. My current project was sort of my, the thing that was driving my thinking about software. And then you get to this. Does anyone know what uh, TV show this is from? It was Silicon Valley, and, and this is uh, Richard breaking up with his girlfriend. And why is he breaking up with her? Is anyone? It's Tabs versus Spaces, right? She uses, ta uh, she uses Spaces, sorry. He uses Tabs, so of course, I mean, 
obviously that's a huge issue. Um, and Harlan Mills has a quote about this long before Silicon Valley. He's not, he's not commenting on Silicon Valley. Um, there was no mathematical rigor to inhibit these discussions. Some became quite vehement. This scene actually ends with Richard's, Richard throwing himself down the stairs, although it's not really clear why he does that. Um, so what happened? We had these studies. People were studying go-tos and indenting and commenting style in the 70s, and then now we're suddenly, uh, nobody's uh, paying attention to stuff anymore. Well, here's a hint from a quote from Gerald Weinberg, another longtime observer of computer science who I encourage you to read. So he's writing in 1998. He's talking to some programmers in the mid-90s. He says, it's interesting, the coincidence that all of them had learned to program before they studied programming formally in school. That's a major change brought about by the personal computer. I had not even seen a computer before I went to work for IBM in 1956. Yes, there actually were computers in 1956. Um, but it's not a coincidence. This is the important thing that happened. The personal computer is the cause of this throwing everything away. And of course, a lot of the blame rests with these two guys, Paul Allen, uh, rest in peace, and Bill Gates. This is them at Lakeside in the early 70s. Uh, learn to program, teach themselves to program in BASIC on some terminal connected to a mainframe. Uh, they did this a little earlier than most people. Most people didn't quite do this in the early 70s, more like the late 70s when the PCs, uh, all the PCs came out with BASIC. But this is what happened. They, everyone taught themselves to program. Once they had access to a computer, they didn't need any instruction. They didn't need to take a class to get access to a computer. So they just had a giant BASIC programming party. Right about the same time, Edgar Dykstra was frantically trying to get people to stop programming in BASIC. Um, it's practically impossible to teach good programmers to students, good programming to students that have had prior exposure to BASIC. As potential programmers, they are mentally mutilated beyond hopes of generation. So I just do a survey. Who, who learned to program in BASIC? Uh, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So, um, so you can disagree, but I think it took me a while sort of to overcome my sense it because I knew how to program in BASIC, which didn't even have functions with names and parameters when I was learning it. Uh, I was uh, mentally mutilated, might be overstating it, but uh, I was slightly damaged. Now, Dijkstra, like I said, Dijkstra just uh, you know, generates great quotes uh, constantly, or did. Um, but he actually had a point. He really had a point in this article. It's called, How Do We Tell Truths That Might Hurt? And he's basically saying, don't program in basic. There are better languages out there. And if you learn basic first, you're going to hurt yourself. Unfortunately, it's 1975, the year Microsoft was founded. What was Microsoft founded to do? Produce a basic interpreter. What irony. Um, the result is you have a bunch of self-taught programmers out there, right? Like, I was self-taught, and a bunch of people at Microsoft now are self-taught. You may have gone and majored in computer science in school, but you didn't learn to program there, right? You, you taught yourself to program in high school. You kept doing that, whatever worked for you, whatever crazy debugging system and variable naming and all that. And then you kept going at that for a while, probably Microsoft, until eventually you might realize, oh, wow, this isn't quite working for these programming system products, right? This bottom right quadrant, I'm doing top left quadrant stuff, trying to get paid to do bottom right stuff. I have to adapt my, my approach. But really, a lot of people are self-taught. Um, and Harlan Mills, again, writing long before uh, uh, Microsoft was founded, or a little before Microsoft was founded, when there maybe would have been time to fix this problem, but Nobody uh, paid attention. Our present programming courses are patterned along those of a course in French dictionary. In such a course, we study the dictionary and learn what the meaning of French words are in English. That corresponds to learning what PL1 or Fortran statements do to data, just learn the syntax of the, of the language. At the completion of such a course in French dictionary, we then invite and exhort the graduates to go forth and write French poetry, which corresponds to writing code. I think I can stop explaining the analogy at this point. Of course, the result is that some people can write French poetry and some not, but the skills critical to writing poetry were not learned in the course they just took in French dictionary. So many self-taught programmers happen to be naturally clever people and can write software, but they're not taught that in college. They just happen to have that, that skill, and they taught themselves. They read a basic manual like I did, which has the syntax, but doesn't really explain anything about why you should be doing this stuff. Um, and Harlan Mills again pipes in, if the precision and scope are not gained in university education, it is difficult to acquire them later. No matter how well motivated or adept a person might be at individual intuitive approaches to problem solving. So you may be great in the top left box, but it doesn't mean you're going to be good 
at the bottom right box, the programming systems product. So you may not know things you'd like to know, like what's the right programming language to use? People just tend to use the same programming language they used for the previous problem they saw. Uh, what to look for in code reviews? What to look for in hiring, right? Notoriously, interviews for software developers are kind of random. Uh, how reliable are your software is? Is your software about to fail? Is your software obsolete? So the vast majority of the software, for example, that runs the internet and is the first piece of software to contact a potentially malicious network packet is written in C because it's going to be something in the guts of Unix, Linux, or Windows. And that's like exactly the worst language uh, for that kind of thing because it's so exploitable by design, but uh, it wasn't meant to uh, be connected to the internet. So when you talk to a civil engineer, they can look at a bridge and say, this bridge is about to collapse. And they can say, well, if you do this stuff, you might fix it up and it'll last a while longer, or maybe it's hopeless, it's going to collapse no matter what. Uh, that's what engineers can do. When you look at something like the, the Office source code base, which you know, I happen to be, work with for a while, now I'm not making any claims about the Office code base being obsolete or not, but it would be very hard to answer the question, is the Office code base obsolete or not? I know a lot of work has been done to improve it, but is it actually being fixed up, or is it just you're painting a bridge which is going to collapse anyway? It's just very hard to make these kind of statements because there's not a lot of theory behind software. And programmers are just content to use their own experience as a guide, right? Whatever they learned about anything in software, they're like, well, works for me. People are throwing money at me. This is great. I've got a career. I don't like to think too deeply about whether I'm doing the right thing. So Fred Brooks, uh, another thing he said, which I think is sort of symptomatic of programmers, so about nine years after the No Silver Bullet essay, he wrote a follow-up essay uh, for a second version of his book. And he's talking about people attacking the No Silver Bullet essay. He said they mostly attack the central argument that there is no magical solution, and his opinion that there cannot be one. So they agree with his arguments in No Silver Bullet, but then they go on and say there is a silver bullet for the software beast, which the author, the person complaining, has invented. So they're basically saying everybody else is an idiot, but I know the answer. I can solve the software problem, which is sort of the ultimate thing a software engineer would say. This is Icarus, the uh, Greek legend. So Icarus was, was stuck on an island, imprisoned. Uh, sort of a long story. But anyway, his father uh, built, made wings out of feathers and attached them with wax. And they, they attempted to fly uh, away from the island they were imprisoned on. At, uh, at some point, I, I'm not sure this actually really happened, but, um, <laughs> but he got uh, interested in the sun and he flew too close to the sun and the, the, uh, the wax melted, the wings fell off and he drowned in the sea. Poor guy. Um, and it, it, he's the, sort of the, the, the picture of hubris, right? People thinking they can do more than they actually can. This is a quote from Alexis Ohanian who founded Reddit, but it, it, for the purpose of this, He's also married to Serena Williams, right? Arguably the greatest female tennis player in history. So he found a rat. He's got a very successful website, thinks he's a genius. And then he actually observes Serena Williams training uh, to be great at tennis. And he says, I thought I was the hardest working person on the planet. I thought we, we software, were the hardest working industry. That's what we tell ourselves. It's all malarkey. I've had this front row seat over the last three years to greatness. It's a humbling experience seeing what it takes to actually be that great. So he is sort of realizing he's not quite as awesome as he thought he was, just because he could crank out a website. And uh, Gerald Weinberg, once again, pops in, saying the essential personality factor in programming is a small dose of humility. And then he goes on to explain that uh, without that, you'll be, go for the classic pattern of uh, Greek drama, like Icarus, uh, that success leads to overconfidence, hubris, leading to blind self-destruction, uh, and the idea that a programmer can learn a few simple techniques, self-taught in high school, think you're an expert, and then be crushed by the irresistible power of the computer. Or at least, maybe that's a little dramatic, but you know, have more bugs than they expected kind of thing. And you might think, wow, that's great, but can't we just go back to the simple days of writing code in the top left quadrant and when I used to actually like writing, writing programs? Um, and the answer is no, sorry. You work at Microsoft, uh, you're getting paid to write the programming systems products, not the fun stuff, so uh, deal with it. Um, one problem, though, is how fast it's all happened. So Harlan Mills noted this in 76, that it's all happened in one generation. In the past 25 years, 
You've got this whole new industry that has a critical role in business and government. Had it been spread out over 125 years, five generations instead of just one, you might have a different history. Imagine the opportunity for early industrial development with five human generations of curriculum development, education, feedback for the expansion of useful methodologies, and pruning of less useful topics. Right? Now, you might think, well, okay, but it's been 40 years more, so maybe we've had that. Except remember, we kind of threw everything away about five years after he said this because of the personal computer revolution. People sort of ignored all the wisdom from the 60s and 70s. So we kind of started over. We're about 35 years into attempt two to relearn everything about software development. And it's still basically one generation. You still have people floating around Microsoft who learn to program in basic on some janky computer, and that's uh, where their formative experiences came from. It's like if Orville Wright was running Boeing, if he was still around. But aviation has developed over a long period of time, and all the pioneers have aged out. Orville might be sitting there saying, eh, I don't know about those, those newfangled jet engines, and you know, uh, maybe we should stick to balsa wood or whatever. Um, but that's not happening in aviation, but it essentially is happening in, in, in the software industry. The people are still around. The, the early people who taught themselves are still around. Um, and if you learn to program up in the top left, uh, it's hard to adapt to understand what's necessary for the bottom right. Microsoft's actually done a pretty good job. I have to say, now I'm a software consultant. I go look at companies all over the place. And Microsoft's actually pretty good in their techniques. I mean, it took a long time, a lot of painful learning, but actually, uh, they have a pretty good handle on writing these programming systems products at this point, although a lot of mistakes were made. If you wanted some fancy, so this is actually randomly, I got, I saw something Microsoft redid their procurement site, the internal procurement site. So I was just looking for a diagram of a complicated software component, uh, software system, and, and came up with this. But there's a bunch of pieces here, right? They're all stitched together with APIs, and it's got a bunch of different modules. Clearly, it's in the bottom right quadrant. And this is complicated. It's not just a simple program. And this is just an internal procurement site for Microsoft, right? It's not the world's most complicated software. And so, but you have to do all the hard things. You have to, you have to worry about documentation and write unit tests and do static analysis and, and all this stuff and think about API design. Uh, it's a lot of work. It seems more fun to write small software, but that's the way it is these days. In the aviation, there were the, the heroes. This is Charles Lindbergh, the uh, first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. Uh, a lot of hero pilots, and the hero pilots did awesome stuff and inspired people. But eventually, they either from being a little too heroic or just from aging out, they, they were no longer on the scene. Um, but you still have a lot of hero, and Microsoft went through a phase where they celebrated hero programmers, which I think they've mostly gotten over. But there was a lot of that, the, the person in the corner cranking out code. Uh, was, was revered, and that's just not what you need for real software development. And the one thing I want to talk about is performance. So this is uh, Donald Knuth's probably most famous quote, Donald Knuth, another longtime writer about software. There's no doubt that the grail of efficiency leads to abuse. Grail of efficiency meaning worried about performance over other stuff. Programmers waste enormous amounts of time thinking about or worrying about the speed of non-critical parts of their programs. And these attempts at efficiency actually have a strong negative impact when debugging and maintenance are considered. We should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. That, that, that is the, the, the famous quote from Knuth. Now, if you're back in the old days, you're programming this thing, which is an early TRS-80 Model 1. So this had 4K of memory. That 4,096 bytes, not 4 meg or 4 gig or whatever, 4K. Uh, it had a basic in ROM that, uh, so the basic was in ROM, but 4K had to hold the language, I mean, I mean the, the, the program and the data. The thing had, you could have 26 numeric variables, A through Z, two strings, A dollar sign and B dollar sign, and one array, A, for array, I guess. Um, but people actually wrote software in this thing, you know, miraculously. Okay, in that environment, you're worried about performance, right? Because, like, you know, it's... There's not a lot of room. But you're also writing, you're up in the top left quadrant, right? Probably there weren't a lot of large software development projects going on in this thing. Uh, it was single people writing some piece of software for themselves. So fine, do whatever you want. When one person's writing on 
when one person's working on a piece of software, you can use almost any language, almost any technique, because you'll know what you mean when you read it, especially if you're not using it for a long time. But people still like to focus on performance because it's measurable. In particular, you can measure performance if you're in a top left quadrant, right? Any small piece of software can be tuned and made faster. It feels like you're doing something useful because uh, you can measure it. Uh, measuring maintainability and is my API easily consumable by somebody else involves dealing with, with other people, basically not, not really uh, what programmers want to do. But, but when you're working on this stuff, that's what you got to worry about. So it's much easier to focus on performance. You can get this gratification. Oh, look, I made it faster. Um, and you don't have to deal with other people. But <laughs> unfortunately, when you work in a large software company, you have to deal with other people. And other people reading your code is much more important than you geeking out on some random performance tweak uh, that makes it harder to read. And even today, I hear people say, okay, what's, what's wrong with today's young programmers, the kids today? And they'll probably complain about performance. They'll probably say, well, they're, they're all smart and everything, but they write this C-sharp code to manipulate a string and they don't realize what's going on underneath. Oh my God, and I'm like, that is the greatest thing. Like, that they don't have to worry about that. They also don't get exploited by uh, random script kitties on the internet too, which is a nice thing. So uh, the fact that you don't have to worry about this, you have languages that take care of these basics of memory allocation is a huge advancement. Uh, in software and, and not some horrible thing that people are ignoring performance. Uh, Dykstra was talking about this. He's, he's talking about go-tos, but he's saying why go-tos are bad, but it's, the second part is important. We're trying to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process. That is, you read a program spread out in text space, you want to figure out what's going on in memory of the process. So you need to worry about readability, not performance. And focus on whether people can understand the thing when they read it. Uh, performance and readability are opposed to each other. This is the spy versus spy guys from Mad Magazine, which may be a slightly old reference here. But um, Now I know people probably have some idea in mind where, okay, there was an algorithm and I made it, I managed to make it easier to read and faster and simpler and it's all like performance and readability were marching together hand in hand, but that almost never happens. Uh, they generally are uh, opposed, you start with something nice and clean, and then you say, oh, it's too slow, I better start hacking away at it. I'm gonna add an extra parameter, I'm gonna make the code more complicated to handle some special case, I'll add some side access to the data, whatever. Um, and it just gets a, takes away from readability. Also point out, you could change the word readability to manage code and the word performance to native code, and you would have a graphic summary of a battle that raged inside Microsoft for most of the decade of the 2000s between the .NET API and the uh, Windows native API over what is the story we tell developers and the story developers heard was, I'll go write iOS applications instead. So this really uh, causes problems. Obviously you can guess which side I'm on and I think most of this has been resolved at this point in favor of, of managed code. Um, but people are making claims about performance and readability being able to be improved together that I, I don't believe are true. They tend to be opposites of each other. So I'll just clean up Knuth's quote. Instead of saying premature optimization is the root of all evil, I'll just say optimization is the root of all evil. Hey, it's me this year. Uh, now this does not mean you never optimize, right? This is a takeoff on the quote, money is the root of all evil. So that doesn't mean you never use money, you should, we should get rid of money. It just means that money causes problems and you have to be careful about it. So same thing, I'm not saying never optimize, I'm just saying be careful because when you have problems with your software, a lot of times it's because somebody was, was over-optimizing. Of course, people always have excuses to optimize, right? They start out, you're working on some mini computer with small amounts of memory, then the PC comes along, it's got small amounts of memory, next generation has these small devices, they have way more memory than these other things, but still, ah gee, it's kind of a handheld, I better start optimizing here. Uh, but just don't do it. Uh, my father tells a story of, someone explained, how do you identify a tree in Oregon? And the answer is you just point it and say, it's a Douglas fir. Now you'll be occasionally wrong, but really not enough to, to matter. Same thing with optimization. When someone says, should I optimize something, just say no. Occasionally you'll be wrong, but again, not enough to matter. And if someone wants to add a cache or something, just, just like, don't do it. 
Uh, again, caches are great fun. They're nice little top left things you can do and you can tweak them and oh, it's so much fun to write a cache, but um, you know, it's just gonna collect bugs um, along with the data. And well, now things are moving to the cloud. This is good because it, it, it clears away some of the, uh, the, the grunge in code because you have to deal with the problems, right? You can't just throw it over to user and they have to worry about all the bugs. Um, so it's nice. It in inspires people to write maintainable code because they feel the pain more. Um, but it's also, uh, there's some good techniques here. Um, you know, not, and I'm not uh, throwing a buzzword here claiming that uh, containerized microservices are a silver bullet for software development. Uh, even though, of course, some people are saying that. Um, but it does, when you start connecting services that can scale independently, this is sort of the modern way to write software. In particular, you can, they can, they can uh, work independently. They're connected by APIs, which are not these ugly binary APIs that are hard to debug. You can actually, you can log them, you can replay them. It's very nice. You don't have to worry about memory allocation. I mean, another aspect of this sort of performance versus Readability is people who write code that obsessively checks for memory allocation failures and you wind up with the actual logic as seven ifs down over here on the barely fits in your editor. Um, that's not thing about managed code. People could just write code that pretends that memory never runs out. I mean, I know they don't really do it. They actually catch the exception, right? And we do something when memory runs out. But reality is people just pretend memory never runs out, uh, which is great because memory never does run out. And if it does and it's a service, who cares, it gets restarted. So you can write cleaner code. Uh, I mean, the difference between your memory allocation failing and you cascading up a failure versus throwing an exception which isn't handled is, there is no difference, just restart the thing. So uh, eventually we'll all be writing software like this. This is my claim. Like even some game will be written like this to be reliable uh, and scalable. Even though you might say, oh, but it won't perform well, but it's worth it to make more maintainable code. And you can actually get to some notion of, I want to make this thing twice as strong. I want to make it twice as reliable because you can actually uh, handle it with programming techniques which are harder, but that's what we need to move to. Uh, this is a quote from Lord of the Rings, shortcuts make long delays, but you, you can't skimp on this stuff. You have to do the, like I said, you got to write the tests and you got to do the code reviews and all that stuff. Um, this is the same advice we were giving in Engineering Excellence 10 years ago inside Microsoft. Um, and if you're a manager, uh, then please give your employees time to do this, right? Uh, don't look at some schedule and say, I don't know, I think I could do it in half the time, right? Because you're thinking of the old way, the, the grungy way of writing code. You're not thinking about modern software development where things just take a lot longer and there's a lot more to do. So Harl Mills, again, this is 40 years ago, said the next generation of programmers will be much more competent than the first ones they'll have to be. Just as it was easier to get into college in the good old days, it was also easier to get by as a programmer in the good old days. For this new generation, a programmer will need to be capable of a level of precision and productivity never dreamed of before. Now, he was writing in 78, and I think the next generation, which is my generation basically, did do that. We were better programmers. We had better tools. We had better techniques. We wrote better code uh, than they did in the 70s. Um, but it has to happen again. People always tend to write software that's just about as complicated as a human being can handle, right? So if you're writing in assembly language in 1967 or something, then maybe getting a sort to work is like barely something you can handle. And now, Many years later, getting something like Windows to work is, again, sort of at the limit of human ability. Um, and we'll be doing more complicated stuff in the future, and people have to like, do more stuff to be more productive. And hopefully we can get academia back working with industry again, so there will actually be some scientific backing to all this stuff. I do encourage people to uh, work with the ACM and IEEE Computer Society, which are industry trade groups. And I don't mean just people in research. I know research. People in Building 99 go to a lot of conferences and, 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 and present a lot of conferences, but I really encourage everyday product group people at Microsoft to also get involved. There's a lot of wisdom there. You can get, there's also a lot of wisdom to share. Like I said, Microsoft actually does a pretty good job of software development, and a lot of companies could learn from Microsoft if you were out there uh, talking about it, which 
we tend not to do. We, excuse me, I mean you. I don't work for Microsoft anymore. Um, if you want something to read besides, obviously, you know, my book, uh, I do think these three, this is basically Harlan Mills' book, Fred Brooks's book, and Jerry Weinberg's book are great, even though they're all old. A lot of the wisdom still applies because it's the same problems people had back in the day. Uh, Dijkstra has some good books too, but his books tend to mix together something insightful about programming with a proof that a sort algorithm is faster than another sort algorithm or something. So they're kind of a mix, but these are all good. These are all about technique and process and, and management. And finally, if you feel any residual guilt because you're working for Microsoft and Microsoft was founded to create a basic interpreter and go pollute the world with uh, mentally mutilated programmers. Uh, I used to work at Engineering Excellence. Once Engineering Excellence was shut down uh, a little bit after I left. I, I think that's a coincidence, but um, I, I wish Microsoft would study itself more. Uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, we found that people tended to not be interested in advice from other groups at Microsoft because they could easily understand, well, that, we're Windows and they're Office and we're completely different, so I'll just ignore that advice. Whereas they take something like Agile, which wasn't really relevant to Microsoft in most cases, but they'd like, oh, this is great. Um, so I encourage Microsoft to study, to look inward a bit. Like I said, there's a lot of wisdom at Microsoft uh, that could be shared and try to make up to the world for creating a generation of basic, self-taught basic programmers. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my presentation. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Um, you can contact me on Twitter. Uh, Andy can also get a hold of me. Um, I post occasionally on Twitter, um, but it's the easiest way uh, to get a hold of me. And uh, I, I, I'll answer questions, but first I want to actually uh, give away a copy of the book. Um, there's, other, there's copies of that in the other book, but uh, if someone wants to win a copy. So the question is, I have a, a trivia question that you have to answer. So uh, it's a little old school. So Dykstra in his talk the, the, where he was uh, ragging on basic uh, and saying that it mentally mutilates people, he also criticized four other languages that were current at the time. And the question is, can you name three of them? Three of the languages that Dykstra was also criticizing. Yes, in the back. I'll take a stamp. Uh, okay. Algol, Cobol, and Fortran. They're close. You have two out of three. Pascal? Nope, not Pascal. Well, I get a fourth one, don't I? What's up? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's PL1. Well, okay, what are the three? Um, you gotta, you gotta Fortran, PL1, and Cobol. Yes, that's right. Fortran, PL1, and Cobol. So, he did actually, he liked Algol. Algol is actually a pretty good language. It's really the the ancestor of, of most procedural languages, C, C sharp, all kind of come from Algol. It's the first one with what, what seems obvious now, but you know, if statements with blocks of code after them, which was kind of a, a big idea then. Uh, really, the first language that didn't require go to's to write uh, decent code. Yeah, so he, Dijkstra was on, he didn't like COBOL, Fortran, PL1, and, and APL. APL, which is, I mean, it's sort of a programming language, it's sort of a cross between a programming language and a and a cry for help, but it was actually, <laughs> it was a serious language that IBM uh, you came up with, uh, God knows why, and, uh, and uh, you know, he of course, I mean, making fun of APL is sort of easy, but, but uh, Dijkstra also is pointing out that there were other problems. PL1's not bad, actually, I'm not sure why I didn't like PL1, probably because he wasn't involved in creating it and he had some beef with IBM, but um, yes, he was uh, against most of them except Algol, uh, and of course C was being, Germinated at the time, but he didn't know it probably. So uh, there were better languages coming along. So there you go, uh, Eric, uh, my former manager. In fact, in engineering excellence, you have a, you have won a copy of the problem with software. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm happy to take questions uh, if anybody has any questions on that. And like I said, I have copies of the this book and the other two books while I'm here. If you want to uh, improve your bug, your code reading, or figure out what happened in Microsoft in the 90s, uh, you're welcome to come up and peruse those. Um, yes, question. Oh, well, well, in the back there, I guess. Yeah. No, yeah, sorry, gray sweatshirt, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the quadrants a couple right. of times. Um, and so my question is sort of about technical interviews, because in universities, when we do interviews, we tend to ask questions about that top left quadrant, right? right? And it seems like to be successful, you're talking about the bottom right quadrant. So. What should we do about this? Should we do, be doing interviews differently? We're well, testing for the wrong quadrant or something else? Well, yeah, that, that's a very good question. So I think that, 
So in a, in a whiteboard interview, you're stuck in the top left quadrant, right? I mean, that's all you have, right? You, you can't whiteboard out anything that's at all complicated. Um, uh, you know, even something like an API design. You can talk about an API, API design, maybe testing, kind of get a little bit into the other ones, but you do want to ask people coding questions and, and, and they're going to be small uh, of necessity. I think what you can ask them though is about experience. Part of what the book talks about is, is I wish academia would focus more on these bottom right quadrant pieces of code. In particular, there's tons of open source out there now. So you could just have a class where you were hacking on the Linux kernel or the Windows kernel. If, I don't know what the state of open sourcing Windows is, but, um, or anything. There's so much open, uh, uh, open source software out there that you could have, you could have people modify it and, and read large bodies of code and try to make modifications and understand different styles. So I'm hoping people will come out of college having done that and then you could ask them about it. You know, tell me about a time you had to consume a large body of code. Tell me about how you'd approach this, talk about something you liked or disliked in, in somebody else's code. So you could ask more experiential questions about it. Um, because you could bring up some giant source code listing in an interview and ask people to, to figure out what's going on, but that's, that's a little probably too, too strict. But hopefully they, they, they would have experiences coming out of college that they could talk about. I once did a, when I was in engineering excellence, I actually had the ability to ask HR to look through interview feedback uh, to see if people are touching on the, the 10 competencies that Microsoft had at the time, one of which was technical excellence, and the others were communication and cross-team and all those other things. And like 100% of every single interview had asked a coding question. And of the other nine competencies, on average, two or three were covered at any point uh, during, the, during the day. And the other six or seven were just completely ignored during the interviews. And these were theoretically the 10 important things that Microsoft was looking for. So um, I think in coding, it, it, it's good to ask. You don't, it does not have to be about the coding question. You can ask about, tell me about a time you did this or worked on a team or had to design an API or consume an API. And hopefully people have experiences they can talk about. Yes. Are there any uh, good books that you would, so you talked about Microsoft and sort of best practices, and I think it's similar to many companies, which is code reviews and testing and design and documentation. Are there any good modern books on this stuff? Um, I mean, how well, like, the question is how well known, like you talk about why they make mistakes, but how do we get programmers to do a better job? Well, there's, there's um, I mean, a lot of books tend to be, the problem with a lot of books is they, they talk about something useful, right? But then they, they present it as it solves all problems, right? So you wind up with sort of overhyped books um, that have a core that's useful, but then they, they overstate the, the, the solution. So a book on unit testing will present unit testing as the, the answer to all problems when, I mean, there's reasons, you know, there's things you can do with unit testing and things you can't do with unit testing. Um, I don't know a book, um, you know, I actually recommend what I prefer people read is there's a book called Making Software, which is about a bunch of empirical uh, software studies, that people actually studying software teams and saying we observed them and they did this and they did that and this worked. Uh, that's published by O'Reilly. That one's pretty good. Empirical studies have sort of, have sort of died out, uh, unfortunately. People actually studying programmers sort of anthropologically. There's still a few conferences. There's a, but, but that's a pretty good one, uh, making software. But yeah, I don't, I don't know a book that sort of in a no BS kind of way uh, lays out what to do. Code Complete uh, Code Complete 2, Steve McConnell's book, which is 20 or 30 years old, uh, is pretty good. It's also backed by research. Like he'll actually say, the, the right length for a method in line, number of lines of code is X because somebody studied it, not just because I feel that way. Unfortunately, his studies are all kind of old because uh, people stop, kind of stop doing that. Yes? So you mentioned that uh, you believe today's generation writes better software than previous generations or writes the software better. Huh? Um, any thoughts what we could do today to prepare for the next generation? And I'm asking because I'm also working in a team that has code right. writers that is 10, 15 well, years old. And you got to prepare. I mean, I mean the, the, one of the points is that by, if you come out of college and you haven't learned this stuff, and you've been successful in college, and you got a job at Microsoft, let's say, interviewing with skills you taught yourself, uh, in, in high school, you're, you're kind of already thinking that you know more than you probably do, and it's hard to change. So I, I, 
I think I wish Microsoft would would go to universities and say, this is the curriculum we want. I think when Microsoft has done that, they focus more on specific skills, like, hey, you, you should all be using Windows and, and C Sharp and Visual Studio with your classes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm trying to get them to say, you need to work with larger code bases, you need to you know, teach debugging, you know, teach code reading, like all this stuff that the actual skills we care about, without, without coming across as, would you just do our job for us? Like, we're tired of training people. We want people who are perfect when they come out of school. It's not going to be like that, but I, I wish there'd be more closing this, this gap between academia and industry. Um, like I said, if people show up, I mean, you know, if, if someone comes in and thinks they, they're, you know, they're God's gift of programming, it's, it's, it takes a while to disabuse them of that knowledge, unfortunately. I mean, it's something you could interview for. You could, you could try to bias against uh, you know, lack of humility, excessive hubris during an interview. Uh, I, I, I would think about that. If they, if they think they're you know, a genius at age 22, they're, they're probably not. I just want to say that not all of us are like that. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, like a lot of the people I've talked to, and when we come out of college, like we go into college and take the CS classes knowing that everyone says you don't learn the right skills for industry in college. Like we're told that straight up front. So a lot of us do come into industry and we expect and we know and we do learn a lot and we talk to each other about all the different things we are learning. So there are those kind of people, but there are also, especially with like the newer generations, especially as colleges are trying to improve their CS classes, they're not going to get everything right. Um, there's only so much you can teach people, like, not in the field. Um, I guess I just want to say we are trying. No, that, that's actually <laughs> great to hear. And there is, and the other thing is, you, you do get people who come to, who, who learn to program in college, right? They, they show up, they're not the high school computer club graduates. I don't know that right, no, sure. it's great. I mean, I knew one person like that in college, and it was like, what, you didn't have a TRS-80 or whatever? I mean, you know, what are you doing here? And, I'm, and, and I mean, we did not treat that person well also. I, you know, like looking back, we were, we were obnoxious about it. But, um, but you know, people are like, hey, you know, I, like, I, I like playing games on my game system. I want to be a programmer. Then they're, and they're just coming kind of, which is great. And I think people like that, because they are exposed to it in at least a more formal environment, they're not reading a basic manual. At least they have some instruction and some guidance, tend to be more open to the idea of, wow, I have things to learn. Uh, they probably still get this mistreatment of the, the hardcore geeks looking down at them. So I'm, I'm glad you made it through and are here. Um, but it, 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 it is uh, something else you can work at. Just try to make it more welcoming to everybody. Yes. So I have a question about the, the viewpoint you take over the no silver bullet thing. Not that I'm assuming there's a silver bullet. But it feels like um, generationally we've gone 50 years, 60 years even uh, for software engineering. And it feels like what exactly are we looking for with such a silver bullet? Is it to improve reliability bugs? Like, I feel like the goalpost keeps moving, because if, honestly, if you did try to program Windows in assembly language, and like today's Windows, you wouldn't get very far. Right. So something was achieved with all those extra like tools and languages that we've created that has improved the world. Right, so and yeah, things, by no silver things bullet. have been achieved. All those silver bullets have value in some cases, right? The formal testing does have value, you know, structured programming is better, like DevOps is useful in some cases. It's, it's not, people don't have the ability to discern uh, like when I should use this language, so they just write everything in Perl, for example. Um, you know, which Perl is a great language for, for box, top left box, and it's an absolutely abysmal language. I worked on a team, some of whose members are sitting in this room today, uh, that maintained large Perl code bases, and it's just a giant hassle, but you know, it kind of grows like organically. So. I think that the reason people search for a silver bullet is because they realize that software is hard and they, they don't, at some point they realize, well, I don't know everything and they're kind of, you know, any port in a storm kind of thing. Like, oh, wow, maybe DevOps will solve my problems. You know, like, that would be nice. So they, you know, they follow these, uh, you know, charismatic uh, sort of solutions. I have two questions. Uh, so the first question is in regards to what you said about optimization, about how you can point to a tree and say it's a Douglas fir, and you're probably right. So in terms of software development, though, so are you saying that, I guess, where in the process of developing software do you think we should be thinking about edge cases and, like, what kind of guidance would you give to making the judgment call on whether or not to spend those time and resources, like implementing code that would only actually really be used in an edge case, even though the edge case doesn't really 
happen very often. Yeah, I mean, the, the edge cases, I mean, I was talking about pre-optimized, basically saying, well, this might run slow. I better optimize well, it, it now. Right, I mean, so in, in those edge cases, I mean, my, my advice base would be, would be don't do it. I mean, I mean, write the code cleanly, make sure it's understandable, focus on that, maintainability, and then if it gets deployed and it's slow, worry about that. You know, essentially that's my answer. Like, it's so hard to know if it's actually going to be slow and if that code is going to be on the, the critical path that messing it up just in case is is not a good approach. So, so my advice really would be don't optimize it. Write it as clean as you can and worry about it later. That's you know, almost always the right answer. And, and, and when your, your old school manager says, oh no, we should, uh, you know, we, we need to optimize it now then, well, I don't know, that's a, that's a, tough, that's a tough question. The, the existence of, of old school people in the upper echelons of Microsoft, not everybody, but uh, floating around the upper echelons of software companies is an issue because they, they have the wrong instincts in some ways because they're too old school. Yes, in the back. Oh, sorry, you had a second question. I had a second question. So you talked about one of the biggest issues right now within the computer world is that there's this, there are two camps. There's an academic camp and there's an industry camp. And you talk about that separation as part of the problem. So right here on Microsoft, we have like, we have the research, this right. place, but we also have all the other programmers working on like, or software engineers working on the like feature work and things. What would you recommend like things Microsoft can do to maybe bridge that gap? Do you think that needs to be bridged? Do you think? Well, I think I think I think Microsoft. There's enough software being done at Microsoft that research. You know, Andy even said something about how he used to study software developers, and I was like, oh, he used to study software developers. <laughs> it's still April. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think Microsoft, I, I wish research or, or somebody in Microsoft that does research would, would turn around and look at Microsoft and really try to synthesize some wisdom about when is, what language is appropriate for what situation and, you know, when should we get rid of software and, you know, how do we analyze the lifespan of a piece of software because there's, there's really a ton of software inside Microsoft uh, that you could look at without having to go outside and look at open source. So, so I, I, I wish Microsoft would do more of that. I mean, engineering excellence went away Oh, five years ago or something, probably for good reasons, but th th it, it did, we did lose a little bit. And engineering excellence wasn't really doing that as much to, as it should have been either. But I, I wish Microsoft would, would think about uh, doing that kind of study. Yes. Um, there may have been another question before me. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, going back to your first question on for optimization, one of the best pieces of advice I got given by one of the old school programmers who had changed their mind. Do not optimize anything. Write the simplest code, easiest to maintain. We have profilers that will tell us exactly where we need to optimize. But we will spend far more time reading this code and maintaining it than we ever will writing it this one time. Make it easy to deal with in the future. <clears throat> I can add here that, in <clears throat> my opinion, depends on program how many users you have for this established product or not. Because I agree with you. If you write new product, you just do and then you look later. One person objected to me. He said, in Microsoft Word, we basically, because it's one of the mostly used software, we hit every problem that could be on optimization was hit. Because it's used by so many people, it will be hit sooner or later. But that's probably the only example well, so actually, you need to optimize. So the reason why that's on my mind, so the feature that my team was working on, mm -hmm. we had, in the design phase, we tried to think of different edge cases, and we didn't think too much about it. Like, we didn't look too rigorously at the code, because, like, we put it in, but because we thought it was an edge case. Mm -hmm. But then, recently, we had a lot of hot bugs, because it turns out these edge cases, just like you said, there are just so many users who use them, that you will hit the edge cases mm -hmm. at some point. Those edge cases, they're edge cases for a reason. They have performance and then there were some edge cases which we didn't even think of. Yes, I understand. I would say first you do main that it works. It depends on the size of your project in the sense how many users you look at. First you try to get it working, then you see where you had it also depends on your experience page, mm -hmm. on your past experience. Sometimes it's personal experience. You have built your hands on something and you try to yeah. optimize. I that. found that a lot of the senior engineers, the difference mm -hmm. between them and the new ones is the senior engineers just have this intuition. Like they've yes. been cooking for a while and so they have a sense of like 
this is probably what's going to happen if we don't deal with it now, and therefore mm -hmm. this is what we should focus on, not this thing. Yes, it comes from your past experience, and sometimes it's wrong. You just uh, remember, you don't hands on something, and then you try to do it. Every right, I mean, intuition like that is always correct unless it's, unless it's not. So, I mean, it, you know, yes, you, you do get some of a sense of, of, and also just, you know, how to design things cleanly, too. I mean, people may be aiming to design something cl clean, a, an API that's easily consumable, but they might do a bad job, but if they have experience, you get better at that sort of thing. So yeah, there is value and wisdom. I'm not saying all old timers should be, should be marched out the door. Yes, question. Wait till it's in production. But yes, you yes. Yes. So going back to your software engineering, the 50 years, so there have been people like Parnas and others who said, well, you know, if it's really going to be software engineering, then where's the certification? And I guess another way to look at failure is that we don't have such a thing. But there are certain disciplines, right, where like safety critical systems and things where there, there, there is a huge amount of discipline and rigor, right? Um, although I think with IoT and medical instrumentation we're in danger of like that whole thing also becoming consumed by maybe a hack fest. But what, but I guess my top level is like, do you think a software engineering certificate is worth anything? Or what would, if so, what would you know? Put what would you put in it? And uh, are there disciplines where you know you really think we should have it at this point? So I think that we absolutely should have software certification and licensing, but mm -hmm. not today, mm -hmm. um, because we don't have the body of knowledge. Uh, uh, ACM was involved in some projects put together body of knowledge, but it's really just kind of like a brain dump of ideas about software development. There's no academic backing, so. I think we absolutely should have software engineering certification at some point and licensing, but we need to, it'll be, it'll be nice to set it as a forcing function, like in 10 years we'll have it, now we gotta go fix the problem, but I don't know if it actually work, but, um, so I think, yes, we should be licensed, there's lots of things you could learn, and, 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 and I mean, even, you know, security's a big thing, you know, it's all, there's all kinds of things that people make mistakes that they just shouldn't be making, because they're not aware of the, the potential, so, yes, I think we should have it, but people have pushed software engineering, Steve McConnell wrote a book about, about doing engineering licensing today, and I, that I think would be a mistake because there's just not enough actual rigor behind what you'd be licensing people on. So you'd license people, give them a test, but they wouldn't actually be better software engineers as a result. And I'm looking for some actual real wisdom that people could be, could be tested on before they were licensed. So on, on the theme of the divide between academia and industry, um, I spent a lot of time teaching other students at, while I was at university. And, it, and, and university professors are easy to make fun of. Um, and they sort of live in their heads in, in walled gardens. Um, or some of them have part-time jobs and, and they, they also work and, and they do a great job of uh, helping show the in-between. But typically, if you want to become one of those people, that can start to disseminate knowledge at a university. You have to have stayed at the university for a long time instead of going and cooking for a long time and actually getting your hands dirty and building up the intuition. And so now it looks to me like you've got this divide where the very people that we want to be able to go teach at universities are barred from doing so. So how do we approach universities? Well, I mean, I. You know, when I, like I went to Princeton and, and it's, it was Radio Bell Labs actually, and we had a, several of my classes were taught by visiting Bell Labs professors who were not trained particularly as, as professors, but they had, a, they had this industry wisdom, right? They had been working away at the switching code or whatever, and, and it was quite valuable to get their, their input and then mix that with the more theoretical um, teachers. And I know that there are some schools um, that actually really try to, the, the terms, Computer science and software engineering are often used interchangeably. The schools call it one or the other, but there are schools that really try to teach uh, software engineering. I know the Olin College in Massachusetts is really trying to focus on that. Like, let's actually bring in some industry people and like teach what we can about software engineering. So, um, I mean, I think hopefully universities will start to, to worry about this, and more of them will say, "Hey, there, there is a difference, and there, there's theoretical computer science, which can be useful in some cases." and they're software engineering, and we do want the industry people to come in, and we won't worry about do they have a PhD or, or are they published or whatever you worry about when you're hiring. I, I part of my father's a professor, so you know, I don't have a negative view of professors, but he was a math professor, but um, you know, I mean, th there, is, there is this 
focus in academia on publishing and, 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 and things like that. It's not necessarily what's needed right now for, for computer science. Yes, question. I, I guess my question is more, why would we even want to do this? If what we know today is likely to be proven wrong tomorrow, why do we want to lock people in in today's practices right out of school as opposed to just you know, encouraging them to be, I don't know, problem solvers and then adapt to the realities when they go uh, at a job? It, it seems like it's the same kind of like a basic problem. Just uh, I don't think what, what we... Well, we know today it'll be proven wrong. It'll just be shown to be not quite as right as people thought it was. And I think there's also value in, in basically knocking people off their pedestal a bit, off, down a few pegs, when, they, when they're in school. Just force people to learn something. I mean, I basically sailed through school with my self-taught basic programming skills, right? I, I mean, I, I learned some algorithms, but all, all, everything about getting my code working and laying it out and all was just what I figured out as a basic program, which is, which, is, which is not a good thing. And so I think just teaching people anything, teaching them a different language, you know, like getting them this idea that, oh, wow, there is something to learn uh, is very important, just so they come in open to the idea that they don't know everything. It's sort of like, you know, you compare it to medicine. Like, if someone said, I'm a doctor, I didn't go to med school, you'd be like, well, that's really concerning. But you know, if someone's a programmer and they're like, well, I, I, you know, I majored in music or something, which Microsoft has people floating around, um, you'd be like, wow, that's awesome. You know, you, you, you're so smart. But I mean, it's, it's like just as weird. Like, what are you doing? You're, how can a music major be successful as a programmer? But they can because they, can, they don't have to learn much. So I think just having university curriculum where you have to learn something and study some stuff and like, you, know, you have to pay attention to your professors to, to be successful would, would uh, be very helpful just to open people's minds, even if the specific skills aren't as, as critical. No, I agree with that, but I think there's a push towards being more canonical in, in the sense that um, you know, there would be industry people coming in and talking about you know, DevOps practices, or like, I don't know, some random things that are, that are considered to be like, you know, the yeah. current state of software engineering, and that like, locks people in in one worldview. So, I mean, to be fair, like, the Industry usually runs ahead of where academia is, and DevOps practices are showing up in classes. There's like a startup class at, at CMU of how to do engineering if you're in a startup, which is a different set of strategies than you would if you're in a more established company. There's a DevOps class at North Carolina State University on specifically teaching kids how, like university kids, how to do DevOps. That's not good. That's Why is that not good? It's it's like locking people in a mindset. Mm -hmm. It's teaching them skills that. They're, they'll see and learn how to adapt when they get to industry. They'll adapt to whatever they're going to be using at their company. But, and obviously, the techniques and skills and processes that we have today are very different than those that students learned in school 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And that's okay. They'll learn, everyone learns to adapt when they're here. Yeah, I guess my feeling is it, I'd rather have someone come in and talk about DevOps than not come in and talk about DevOps because it's something from industry. But I. What I really wish would happen is that academia would study DevOps and say, this is what's real and this is what's bogus, and then teach that. But having a DevOps person come in is, like I said, better than, and you know, I, I think not even these days, academia is much more receptive to industry and there's a lot more. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is government funding for academic research is down and, and, uh, and, and academics, for the most part, who are research institutes have to partner with industry more and more uh, there's a downside to that, but it does, you know, it, it does help to bridge the gap. I mean, a lot of, a lot of academics can't, you know, hope to have access to huge data centers, right, uh, to do research on uh, DevOps in, a, say, a data center context without, like, maybe having a co-appointment at Amazon or Microsoft, and you see more of that. Um, I think, I think there are some good parts to that, so bad, but. But I think the notion of the ivory tower is is pretty dead these days. I mean, to be to be perfectly honest, I mean, you know, the, the people who are doing theory, you know, there's a lot more systems out there. So I, I think fundamentally, the danger of anything is like we don't get the next great thinkers coming up with some cool abstractions because everybody's sort of down in the weeds working on our problems. I I, I fear more for that actually. And I think the academics are actually studying a lot of open source. They're studying us a lot. So I, I sort of feel over the last um, 
20 years, actually, academics have gotten a lot cozier with the industry. And no, they, it's been they, good for us. They have gotten cozier, but I still, I still don't, you know, I've looked through curriculums and stuff, and it seems like they're, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say what industry is talking about. They'll talk about Scrum or whatever, but it, it, they're not, they're just sort of presenting it as here's the thing you'll encounter. They're not thinking about it. Well, they're, they're not actively studying, studying it. it. There are researchers, there's a whole empirical software engineering field, which I, you should really look at. No, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's in the books, and I don't know, you're, you're glossing no, over like a whole movement that's happened. No, no, I've, I've read a lot of empirical yeah. studies books, and I, I make a big push for it. 20 years ago, there's, it's right. huge, right? I mean, huge. So I, it's not I, somewhere I, between like a third yeah, to a quarter of the papers that you would see at any academic software engineering conference yeah. these days are yeah there's there's so much more now yeah, I, mean, I think it's very it used to be almost nothing it's a very but good i mean he, you know it used to be more you know 40 years ago maybe it dipped it's coming back but yeah. like i said the making software book is a bunch of empirical studies which is great yeah. um you know and there's occasional but i mean maybe we have different experiences of what we've seen but my sense talk, i talked to a couple of empirical studies people and you know they felt it was not it was still kind of you know, it was it was surviving, but it wasn't really booming. Hmm. You know, I talked to Victor Brazili, who's one of the sort of you know gurus of empirical yeah, studies. Yeah, he's retired. He just so, retired. I mean, yeah, he's like yeah, really you know. finger on the pulse anymore. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, and that's like that's two generations. You should be talking with the new kids on the block. Well, I mean, he he was around. Yeah, he already retired recently. So, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. I think it's a little. I could introduce you to some. Would be happy to introduce you to some more. We know Vic. We work with him. Right. No, that's great. I mean, if, if empirical studies may come back, that's wonderful. I talk a lot about empirical studies in the book, but I, you know, haven't quite seen it maybe as much as you have, but that's good. But yeah, so one of the things you mentioned was empirical studies sort of start to feel old after 50 years. Um, so these, people do these randomized control trials, they do these A-B tests, and then about, say, variable naming. But then they start to feel old. How do you keep these things fresh, and like, how do you keep them in the minds of working professionals? Well, I think you just—I mean, it may have from empirical studies are coming back. That's great, but you know, uh, you just have to keep doing them, right? I mean, it is back. you know, it is back. It is back. okay, 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 it is. okay. okay right. I can, uh, you, um, you can have another talk. Uh, no, I mean, you just, have, you just have to keep doing it, and people have to be recognized for it, and, and companies have to have to start consuming that information, and you have to, Microsoft has to have somebody come from a conference and say, hey, guess what, Hungarian is a crazy idea, you know, or whatever, like, which doesn't, I did not observe that in a product group. Anyway, people are coming back from an ACM conference and saying, you know, hey, I learned something about software engineering. So maybe it came to research, but it didn't cross over, at least into the groups I worked on. Yes. Yeah. What's your opinion on unit tests? How important are such? Because I found that unit tests do not catch actual many problems. Well, in my opinion, unit tests are to allow you to refactor the code without breaking it. That's what unit tests do. Right? And refactoring code is good, so cleaning up your code is good. So unit tests guard against breaking your code accidentally, regressing some other random thing. I don't think they really help with overall software quality, except that when your code is refactorable, it can help with the quality. But I think uh, there's a, you know, unit testing is not in, you know, is not automated uh, functionality testing. But it's still important because having refactorable code is important. So, like, don't throw it away. It's difficult to refactor code because you refactor code and you need to rewrite unit tests. That's what yeah, happens to me all the that's time. That's true. And that slows down you two or three times. Yes, it does. That's right. I mean, that's one. You give up on refactoring, actually. Yes, but that's one of the things where you just got to do it. Like, it's part of software is slowing down a bit because. You're trying to be more precise about it. So. I'm a little bit more in favor of functional tests because they less depend on refactoring and they actually check for the final. Thing. Right, no, they're, they're, they're both useful for a different thing, right? End user testing is to make sure the thing actually works the way it, it's supposed to work, and unit testing is so you can clean up the code without breaking it. You know, I mean, they're related, but they're, they're both testing. But I think unit, te they're both, you know, unit testing is oversold as you can get end user functionality quality with unit testing. I don't think they're. That's not what it's about. Yes. So in the industry now, there's this really strong trade-off between being able to write and ship code very quickly, like in a startup, and the minimal or the maximum amount of bugs you can that a customer will accept before switching to another piece of software. It feels like the idea that you're suggesting, which is that software development in order to become reliable needs to slow down even further, is <laughs> antithetical to the idea that you need to go faster and faster in order to compete in the marketplace. Only successful companies have the option of uh, making reliable software. 
Well, I mean, I mean, you're right. I'm biased in favor of more reliable software and against, you know, throwing something out there to, to, uh, you know, to to hit the market. I mean, so I guess, I like, yes, there may be cases where you can, uh, getting something out quicker with lower quality is a good business decision. But, um, you know, just like occasionally you can build a bridge that's a little rickety because it's, for whatever reason, it's fine. But, but uh, I mean. Again, that's more of a business decision. It would be really nice if you could say, I want this quality level and this speed trade-off, and I could actually make some like, pretty reliable prediction about it, and just, then it's just a business decision purely versus kind of winding up with something because you're in a hurry and you cut corners. You're like, well, I guess that's what we're shipping because we got customers lined up. Which, you know, that's not engineering. Yeah, but arguably, speed these days comes from uh, putting together systems rather than writing systems from scratch. That uh, the microservices model that you, uh, that you put up there that is the form of much of the software that's written today, um, those microservices don't take, aren't a huge amount of code, but you do need to write them very carefully. And writing them slowly and correctly is actually much faster because they perform, you, you create the system faster from a lot of small pieces. If those small pieces are terrible, you, you have trouble. Now, I, I don't think speed in software development uh, anymore is about volume of code. I think it's about working components of code that work together with other existing components. It is fascinating when, I, when we study companies now for, for Crosslake. I mean, a lot of them are just like grabbing open source components and and throwing them together, like hundreds of open source components and, and, and making software. Like it's, it's sort of turning this like assembly line for a lot of it. And it's just knowing, the skill is knowing what to grab, not to, you know, not, not actually writing these complicated code. Um, for, for your basic, like a, you know, your database back website, you know, kind of Ruby on Rails kind of territory, it's like there's not a lot of software engineering. But again, I'm not, I'm thinking about more like things like Windows and Office, which are big and complicated. That's what I'm worried about, not some guy putting up a, you know, a clone of Reddit or something. Well, I, I would sort of second um, the comment here, which is open source also drives out the economic incentive to actually test your code properly, because you simply don't have the economic resources. So if you actually look at the heart of some open source projects, you know, I, I'm just saying there are economic incentives at play here that go directly against our goal of building more reliable. No, yeah, you're, you're I mean, right. If you have no money, you can't afford to hire testers, as it comes out, and nobody wants to do the scut work of spending like half their time writing tests for the new feature they're submitting. They write the feature, submit it with barely any testing, and it's... Right. No, you're right. I mean, yes, their economic sense is pushing against doing things the right way. I, I don't deny that. So, more on this side of the argument. <laughs> so, at JPL, when, like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, they write a bunch of code too. And so I read a really interesting article where it went into depth about the coding practices and how they write software for like space flights and space missions, like for devices that really was a miles away. You can't debug that thing. Yeah. Like you have to write it and get it right the first time. And so they went through it, and so they have extensive documentation, extensive testing, a bunch of theory in there too, just to make sure that because if the program goes wrong, there's nothing you can do, and that's like billions of dollars wasted. And so I understand that's a unique circumstance, mm -hmm. but the article, the point of the the article was really trying to drive home the point that. That's like the gold standard that industry should eventually get to the point where maybe we can also get to that. So like there are economic incentives, and especially if you're doing a startup and you have like a new idea, you need to get it out before anyone else does it. But like there are, it's not impossible, like it is a possible reality that we could get to the point where the way we do software development is as rigorous and like detailed and like extensive testing, like you can imagine, you're like funneling millions of dollars into making this device, and for every extra gram or pound you have, that's another like billion dollars in jet fuel or something. So those are extenuating circumstances, but I think we're in a unique circumstance, given where the industry have is right now, that we have really big companies with a lot of really big resources that maybe we could spare those like extra days or weeks or something to maybe, I don't know, I'm just saying there are, there are examples that exist like currently exist where they are more or less the gold standard for the ideal case of software testing. So totally agree with, with what you're saying. And I'd love to see a variance of this talk, or maybe six variants of this talk, where you <laughs> go one abstraction level down 
into particular industries because mm -hmm. the software is not one big right, right. thing anymore. So to look at startups, to look at rocket companies, to look at, at, at car companies, plane companies, and see like how is it different across those companies with different economic trade-offs and different safety trade-offs. Right. I mean, a lot of stuff is known. It, it is known how to make more reliable software. People just don't choose not to for a variety of reasons, economics. They don't know it. They don't want to deal with it. They're being successful without it, you know, whatever. They, you know, I mean, like there's a bunch of things. Uh, but yeah, I don't think there's like a, it's not a huge mystery necessarily how to write better software. I mean, JPL, which is where a lot of empirical studies were done, was like, you know, yes, they, they knew they needed to make it right, so they, they, they took the effort and, Everybody's bought into that because that's what the project was for. In Microsoft three to five years ago, so there was a quite a bit of change. Basically, the test organization was removed. We have software engineers and test, right. and kind of was it the right decision or not? Because it's kind of is there is a I mean, I mean, was it the right decision? Um, sure. Uh, I, I like the move to engineers um, to move to engineering. Um, I think that the argument was that, well, uh, testers are limited because they're, they're, they're in this box, you can only do testing, and, and so a lot of people were, were like not able to do as good work as they, as they could, and it just reduced flexibility because as a manager you couldn't move people around. So, and, and of course, most of the testers were trained as software developers, so they could do the work. Um, so overall, I think it's a good idea. It's more efficient. It removes some friction. You have. There were issues, of course. Uh, some devs didn't want to write tests. Some teams just interpreted it as we're just getting rid of testing and everybody's writing code. I mean, so there's, there were some implementation issues. But yeah, conceptually, I like the idea. I mean, I think devs should own quality, not throw it over the wall to a separate team. So, it's like, been measured as well. The right. quality is actually higher. Than I mean, so, so yeah, I like the idea, uh, you know, like even, <laughs> even if it wasn't necessarily perfect in all cases, I wish. I wish more former test leads had become the engineering managers instead of basically the dev leads usually doing that, even though I've, you know, that's what happened to me. But um, I was a you know, dev leader who became engineering manager. But like, yeah, I think it's a good idea overall. So. But I also heard in one person talking on Google, he said there are a lot of people who work on basic on infrastructure to, of the testing. It's like half of the people actually work right. on infrastructure su supporting a creation of the test cases and running tests. And I don't like the job. I would never kind of be working on that. <laughs> well, well, Google has created a world where, so it's not, to, it's, they work, their infrastructure team, the team that you know, does that stuff is somehow, they've created a world where that is valued. Mm -hmm. It's seen as almost more important than, than doing the product work. And I don't know how they pulled that magic off, but that's just Google's culture. It's like, it's like a, a privilege to be allowed to work on this important stuff that supports other developers. Um, but Microsoft just doesn't have that culture, and so okay. I think it'd be hard I think to, it's just, it I would saw, be nice. I saw cases where we tried, we worked on one point, and just failed, because we tried to create a complex infrastructure test, and it just never worked. Yeah. 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 Ye
That's all the time we have. Thank you so much. Thank our speaker.